Today we have our next speakers came from all along from Berlin, German. Let's welcome him with a big hand. And please say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be at uh, Costco today. Yeah, likewise. Hello, everyone. And uh, we're looking forward to to questions after the talk. Okay. We know privacy on the internet is very important right now, and it it's being stuck due to the different kind of vicious circle. And today, Hendrik and Frederick will uh, give you a the brief of solution or how could we escape from this vicious circle. I'm really looking forward to learn from them. Then let's go. Hello and thanks everybody for being with us today. My name is Hendrik and I'm giving this talk together with my colleague Frederick. Uh, before we begin, we would like to thank the Costco team for having us. Uh, we are very happy to share our thoughts on privacy on the web with you today. Uh, and first of all, I would like to share our vision with you. Imagine the internet was a place where we could trust each other again. Yeah, before we take a closer look at this vision, uh, Frederick will tell you a little bit uh, about the uh, status quo. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so, yeah, picking up on what Henry has just said, um, we can see that there are two tenets that define the baseline for collecting data on the internet, which universally apply. Um, users on the internet have a right to privacy over the data, and operators have a legitimate interest in usage data of their services. Um, finding a sustainable solution for those requirements um, is contradicting and will always have to include both parties. And uh, we ourselves like to look at this situation from a non-partisan perspective because we believe you can run your website or application in a fair and transparent manner and still make it a business. So um, to us, fairness in handling data is possible and it's not limited to hobby projects. But... How do you create a sustainable balance between the two parties? Mm. Here are what we consider two of the most important issues in this regard. Uh, we believe the collection of personal data must be limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. And we also believe uh, consent must be freely given, specific and informed. By the way, this implies a real choice by the user. Um, yeah, while well, this sounds simple enough, questions arise when you put it into practice. Not only, but especially when you aren't operating at a billion user scale. Um, so yeah, problems handling usage data is not only something that Facebook has to deal with. Um, a lot of people who run smaller services want to do the right thing and treat their users fairly. But if you throw business requirements and all of the local laws that would apply into the mix, it paints a very complicated picture. Complying with laws and following your own ideas while running your website or application can turn into a very deep and also a very frustrating rabbit hole. And this makes people give up and try to find technical solutions and loopholes if it's what they understand much better than laws. Um, yeah, let's come back to the two examples that Hendrik has just given and just rephrase them as questions. 
when is collecting data necessary? When is consent freely given? And answering those two questions is a complicated business because um, both of them have an answer from a business perspective. And they also have an answer from the law perspective. And oftentimes it would be hard to come to a definite conclusion. Let's go into more detail. Um, when is processing of data necessary? It's easy enough to answer this from a business perspective. You just collect what you need to collect. But that certainly does not impress lawmakers. Many of the lawful bases for data processing depend on the processing being necessary. So um, when we're using the established jargon, it must be more than just useful and more than just standard practice. It must be a targeted and proportionate way of achieving a specific purpose. The lawful basis will not apply if you can reasonably achieve the purpose by some other less intrusive means or by processing less data. Um, trying to make this a little easier to understand for you, it's not enough to argue that processing is necessary because you have chosen to operate a business in a particular way. The question is whether the processing is objectively necessary for the stated purpose, not whether it's a necessary part of the chosen methods. So. Um, this does sound complicated. And how does it apply to real world scenarios? For example, you have a web server and it logs IP addresses of users. Do you really need this feature because it's the default or do you need to turn, can you, can you reasonably turn it off? Ask the internet and you will find a lot of conflicting information about this. The same goes for log retention. Do you need to retain those logs forever? Do you need logs at all? Do you need your logs for three months? It's just very hard to tell, but you will need to come to a decision. Um, second example, freely given consent. So in theory, this sounds like a no-brainer, but in practice, it's also very difficult. So when you're collecting data, user consent looks like the most convenient way out of everything. So uh, it looks like an open invitation to do basically anything without having to argue about whether it's necessary. This makes people get very creative when acquiring user consent and also people tend to interpret laws a bit more loosely than they were intended to be. So if you look at uh, one of those consent screens you see on the internet, do you really have a choice? And does your consent really qualify as informed? Um, if you increase the complexity of those solutions, you also increase the complexity of the questions rising. Um, for example, there's the concept of bundled consent. How far can you push bundled consent? The concept does exist legally, but it's disputed how far you can actually take it. So um, each time you build something, you will have to answer this question. Other example is, is it legal if you make your users pay for a tracking free version and if they don't pay, they have to suffer tracking? Apparently it's not legal, but it's still trivial to find big sites acquiring your consent at knife point. Yeah, so I think what you could say is on the one hand, uh, things nowadays are so complicated that the capable people will build technical solutions to legal problems. Uh, most of these solutions are then uh, simply workarounds that uh, circumvent laws. And on the other hand, uh, legislation has no in-depth know-how of the technical details and tries to solve things more or less top-down. Often this means laws miss reality or only represent parts of it. So we think it's time to work from the bottom up. Uh, there are a lot of small sites and services out there that are ignored in the discussions involving the big players only. But exactly the people behind these small services are the ones we think need more support. Because if you step back and look at the whole situation from a distance, it seems that sort of a vicious circle has emerged involving tech and legislation. So why again exactly do we believe this? Um, first of all, 
there is this ambiguous legal situation. Germany, where we are based, is a very good example here. Uh, old national law overlaps with legislation of the European Union called GDPR. Uh, you may have heard about it. However, some of these are not yet enforced. So in Germany, it's already difficult to tell which law is enforced at all. Uh, maybe in the Q&A session at the end, we uh, can talk about what the current state of legislation is uh, in Taiwan in this regard. would be uh, very interesting. What else? Uh, you also see uh, consent is gamed. I'm sure you have noticed there's a great variety of psychological methods out there, as known as dark patterns, to obtain consent in an unfair way. I'm talking about font sizes, button colors, sheer text quantities, and the placement of banners. Yeah, it's also interesting to look at the technological aspects that drive this situation as they define the baseline for our collection of data. And the first thing you will notice is um, when you're using the internet, you will use a browser most of the time. And uh, with browsers, we have a monopoly, which is the Chrome browser and its engine, Chromium. And coincidentally, the owner of this monopoly happens to be a company whose business model is harvesting data, which is Google. And um, this is a perfect example for why regulation has to fail at the technical level. Um, so because when Google decides to implement a new technology, like, for example, federated learning of cohorts, which you might have heard of, this is supposed to be a, a the replacement for third party cookies. So they ship your browser with a global tracking identifier that is then used instead. Um, they, they can implement such a technology much quicker than any state or uh, something like the European Union could be passing or even interpreting a law. Um, yeah, we, we also don't think this situation is going to change anytime soon. Um, because I've already talked about the monopoly. Chrome browser has a market share of 65% right now. Firefox is also dependent on Google, sharing their ad revenue. Uh, Microsoft has recently moved to using the Chromium engine in Edge. So, um, yeah, there's a browser monoculture and this means that new technical standards require the biggest collector of usage data to implement them. Um, also, looking at this, uh, if you look at laws, they are oftentimes focus on implementations instead of the consequences arising for users. So, um, for example, in Europe, we have the cookie law, which is very well defined um, when it comes to regulating client-side tracking. But if you, for example, look at server-side tracking, which could have the very same consequences for users as client-side tracking could have, um, but in any case, server-side tracking is just not included in the cookie law. It's a gray area. And this means managers will push the engineering hours to use server-side tracking instead of client-side tracking, even if the consequences for users are the very same. Um, yeah, where does this lead us? It leads us to annoyed users and confused operators because summing everything up, we don't see a pretty picture. Users' trust in the web has been sustainably damaged. User-friendly regulations have been turned into an annoyance and an argument against proper handling of data. Consent banners are designed to trick you into thinking they are your enemy when in fact they should be your ally. Operators also suffer from the lead ambiguous legal situation and try to stay under the radar. Yeah. And here I want to share maybe uh, some thoughts on our personal motivation. If we truly believe the user deserves to be respected, uh, and for this you have to take the operators along with you in the process. Uh, we think it's not about starting a revolution, uh, it's more about 
starting a trend. Uh, so following are a few basic guidelines that we think can help overcome the current situation. First of all, try to avoid data collection. Mm, data is often collected because it's technically possible. However, then there is no real benefit derived from this. In many cases, small data sets would be already good enough to allow for a comprehensive analysis. Next on the list, be transparent. Uh, so please provide information about your approach to data collection. Next, uh, accept user's choice. This may sound obvious, but it's far uh, from a commonplace. Uh, so think about it. Accept the user's no just as much as a yes. And then another point, build better tools. Uh, tools are often prescribed a certain way of dealing with data that you then just go along with. Uh, so talking about tools. Yeah, um, before we have a look at the tools we are building, thank you to NLNet uh, for providing us with support for working on those tools relevant to the topic. Uh, we couldn't be doing this without you. Thank you very much. Um, so over the course of the last few years, we've been building a few tools in the space of uh, privacy. And I'd like to have a look at three of them now. First one is often fair web analytics. Second one is analytics.txt, disclose what you clicked, and the often consent tool, which lets you manage user consent on websites. Um, often itself is a fair uh, web analytics software, and it comes back to what Hendrik has just said. So we believe that if you have a small set of data, but this set of data is of a very high quality. You can get very good insights on usage of your service without having to invade user privacy. Um, it's self-hosted and you it's distributed under the Apache 2.0 license. It can, if you download the binary, you can run a demo in almost no time on your local machine. So you can check it out. Um, there's analytics.txt, which is a standard for disclosing information about your handling of usage data. So if you run a service and you want to uh, disclose how you handle usage data, you can put an analytics.txt file in a well-known location and then tooling, like for example, browser extensions can pick it up. So there's the standard and we have also published tooling around the standard for you, for example, to parse an analytics.txt file or to serialize your data into such a file or to explain it even to users in plain English. Um, then there's the often consent tool, which is a lightweight solution for managing user consent on websites. So uh, for example, you can handle user consent decisions like for example, does the user allow uh, embedding Twitter widgets, stuff like this. Um, it allows you to do that without having to persist consent decisions yourself. So um, anything stays in perfect control for the user. And it's also pretty lightweight for you as the operator of a website. Yeah, I think in summary, uh, what we are primarily committed to is fairness and trust. Uh, and that means we have to take care about users and operators. So maybe as a last thought here, especially operators with ethical business models will benefit from this attitude as they are already have fairness and trust on their agenda. Uh, so that's all for now from us. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. We look very much forward to your questions. Uh, of course, we would also like to know more about what the situation like in Taiwan in this matter. So feel free to share some insights with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for Hello. your sharing. And I got a couple of questions from audience. And 
first, uh, yes. And if we just, if you, the people just saw their GitHub often, and please start them and check out their website and GitHub. And first, uh, you mentioned about the, you mentioned about the necessity of data collection. And what is the advice you will give to the companies that claim their data collecting is being used to improve the user experience? Mm. <laughs> It's an interesting question. Um, um, maybe the first thing I would say is uh, uh, please double check or really make sure that you use the data actually uh, that you collect to really improve uh, uh, the situation for the user and not for yourself because often that is the case, I think. Okay, thank you. And the second one, um, you just mentioned about the dark patterns. Sometimes users just can, didn't aware or hard to avoid. And is there any suggestion that you can give us to avoid the dark pattern as a user? Um. And this is also a very interesting question. I think for us, it's, um, Hendrik mentioned this in the talk, it's about accepting a yes as much as a no. And once you reach that point, you don't need to use any dark patterns anymore. Um, and so I think this is rather solved at, at like your data collection level, because once you are in a situation where um, your collection of usage data like is totally okay with the user saying, no, I'm not interested, then you can actually start, uh, stop using, stop using dark patterns in, in uh, acquiring consent, because then if your solution is okay with, if your data solution is okay with the user not consenting, then it's very easy to, to build a UI that just says, hey, are you okay with this or not? And user has a very clear choice, yes or no. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And is there other questions? One more, or two. So if the data is completely anonymized, not even the IP address is collected, does it make it fair to collect data? Because um, software like Google Maps, a, a lot of software, they we, we use it uh, all the time, but they all come from people giving anonymous data so that's my question. Um, I mean, to us, consent is very, I, I think to your question, there is no definitive answer. So this will be very subjective. Um, to us, consent is a very important um, piece in that puzzle. So without user consent, without very clear user consent, it's never fair to collect data. Um, to us, transparency is very important. So the user, if you do this, I, I mean, even if it's anonymous, then it has to be, it has to have benefits for the user. It has to be very transparent about why is this happening. Um, you should be able to opt out. You should be able to delete your data at any time. Um, so the fact that data is anonymized to us doesn't really make a difference if you don't collect consent and if you aren't transparent. Because, I mean, for us, for example, there's also one, one it's like, there's a very, to us, very disturbing uh, pattern in 
people showing off their public dashboards for their analytics services. And um, a lot of other analytics softwares do this. And we really don't like this because, I mean, the data is anonymous, but still it's people behind those data points. And um, you really shouldn't, you, you shouldn't say this is anonymous, so let's... Uh, I mean, the fact that you anonymize data doesn't mean that it's still a person behind it. Um, this, this is pretty important to us. So even if you anonymize your data, you should still treat the person behind that data well. Yep, thank you. Any more questions? Don't be shy. You can ask whatever you want. No? Okay. Then let's thank again for Hendrik, Hendrik and Frederick's sharing. And remember to check out their GitHub and give them a star. That's <laughs> give them, please. Yeah, give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks again. You're very it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.